Great, I think that in a few uh, seconds, people should join back to the main room uh, and uh, uh, we can uh, start again. Uh, so just uh, the usual announcements, if you just joined us. So if you are following from YouTube, you can ask question in the chat. I'm sure you have heard these many times. And if you are on Zoom, you can either use the uh, raise and button or ask a question in the chat and I read it uh, for you. So I think that everyone is back in the main meeting room. So please, uh, Marino, if you can share your screen, you can start. Thank you very much. Okay, good afternoon to everybody. So let me share my screen and then I'll optimize screen view. Okay. Here it is. So. Okay, um, so this is my third lectures. Um, um, okay, and uh, the, the topic I'm going to, to speak today is unfortunately fashionable, and that is COVID-19. Um, again, I stress that uh, in a way, uh, my lectures and Professor Andrea Rinaldo's lectures are coordinated in a, a way. Uh, but COVID-19, however, is not included in, in the book that uh, Andrea Rinaldo has been advertising and I have also been advertising. Uh, okay, so uh, very brief, briefly, the, the summary. Uh, first, I will talk about the context and the main uh, epidemiological characteristics of COVID-19. Then I will talk about our model that we developed for Italy, which is a spatially explicit model. And then I will illustrate the model results uh, up to the end of March 2020, which was the first month uh, well, the first one month and a half in Italy. And then uh, I will uh, uh, show um, what might happen after uh, the lockdown, might have happened after the lockdown. And I will talk about the scenarios and the possible containment measures and then a few conclusions. Now, this is something I have already uh, shown to you. Uh, I want to stress again uh, that um, if you look at the statistics of communicable diseases, infectious diseases around the world, you see that the, the share of um, infectious diseases has been shrinking in a way along years. Uh, of course, the number uh, of deaths um, have been increasing because the population of the world has been increasing. But if you look at the share, the red share of communicable and also maternal, neonatal and nutritional diseases, the share have been uh, shrinking. And uh, so around 2017 and uh, probably the same for 2019, um, uh, about 8 million. And now if you look at the statistics COVID-19, it is about 1.55 million deaths. Uh, you know that it is possible to uh, link to Johns Hopkins University site and day by day, you see the sad statistic of uh, global cases, which is probably a large uh, underestimation of the real global cases. Uh, global death is also possible, uh, possibly an underestimation, but not such a large underestimation at the global cases. And so we are to uh, now, uh, we are now to a figure of more than 1.5 million deaths, um, which is really, really a, a very large share. And which means that uh, COVID-19 is really a very important disease in a way. It is not like other infectious diseases that might uh, ravage um, the globe every year, like influenza. It is much more important. Now, uh, let me stress that what I am going to present is actually a teamwork. Uh, um, 
a team uh, um, of people with whom I've been uh, working for a, a long time and uh, who are located in different universities and um, in, uh, in, uh, in, in different places. Also, I, I must admit that they share one common feature. They are Italian anyway. Now, let me um, connect to the lecture by Professor Rinaldi on uh, next uh, uh, Thursday uh, 11th, if I'm not wrong. Uh, to say that um, we have a lot of experience with spatiotemporal dynamics, and that is something that uh, Professor Rinaldi already stressed in the, in the, in the, in the past lecture. And so, for instance, he will show uh, the progress of uh, cholera and IET, and you see data on the left uh, and model uh, on the right, just to let you understand that there is a, a spatial signature in, in many, many, many cases. That is something that you should account for. Uh, and that is common to um, many diseases. So, for instance, this Spanish flu, uh, probably. You may remember that 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 Spanish flu was probably uh, the largest uh, pandemic. Um, uh, I mean, with the exception of, of COVID nineteen. I mean, if we go back in time, the Spanish flu uh, claimed more lives than the First World War, and actually, my grandfather. Uh, who was detained in a concentration camp in, uh, in Austria in Katnau because he was an Italian citizen. And uh, um, unfortunately, he, he was in the um, Austrian-Hungarian uh, Empire in 1915. So he was sent to concentration camp, but, but he, died, he didn't die there um, uh, because uh, it's a lack of food or anything. He, he died of Spanish flu. And if you look, for instance, at the uh, spread of Spanish flu in the United States, you see how uh, fast, oh, I'm sorry, how fast it was. So it started in the, in the, in the Eastern coast and then very rapidly in a few, in a few uh, weeks, it, it uh, spread to the, the whole United States. Okay. Now, let me describe the characteristics uh, of the uh, COVID-19. First of all, the pathogen of COVID-19, it SARS CoV-2. So why two? Because it, it is uh, of the same family um, that uh, actually caused the SARS. So it is an RNA virus. It has a crown-like appearance is actually due to spikes on the surface. So uh, Corona in Latin and in Italian is crown. So it's uh, a beta coronavirus uh, like uh, SARS-CoV-1. And again, to stress the ecological importance uh, of what I am going to say, it is a zoonosis and the host uh, Probably host of several species of bats and rodents, in particular, probably pangolin, uh, maybe other other rodents. And what are the main characteristics of uh, of the of the disease? Now, first of all, the main way the virus spreads is by respiratory droplets. Uh, among people who are in close contact with each other. Now, let me show something. Now, uh, this is an example of the aerosol emission when you breathe. Now, in this case, this is a study which was conducted together with a very famous orchestra. You know, I'm very fond of classical music. Sorry for that. <laughs> and so the, the symphony orchestra, this is by Yerishan Rundfunk. And here you see a way for visualizing uh, the droplets and the aerosols that um, one can emit uh, when singing or uh, playing um, an instrument. 
Now, more rarely, uh, you can get the, the virus via contaminated surfaces, but it is possible, so you, one should be careful about that. Now, another main characteristic that we know now, uh, and uh, now let me provide a, a few uh, technical terms, which are shown here. So if you consider one individual who gets infected, he at first is not infectious. This is called the latent period. Uh, you may remember when we described microparasitic uh, models that we were also uh, talking about susceptible exposed infected recovery, exposed, latent or exposed, just the same, same, same term, which means the same thing that you are um, infected but not infectious. Then at a certain point, you will become infectious. But does, that does not mean that you show symptoms. Symptoms actually, in general, show after a while. Now that, oh, I'm sorry, this period is called incubation. And then you become, sorry, then you become symptomatic. Now, of course, when you're infectious, you can infect someone else. And again, the infectee will have a latent time, incubate the disease, become symptomatic, and the certain point become infectious. Now, we call generation time the interval of time between the moment when the infector was infected and the moment when the infectee was infected. We call serial interval instead the time between when the infectee was uh, became infectious and uh, when the infected becomes uh, sorry um, the time when the infectee gets symptomatic and the time when the um, infected. Uh, get uh, symptomatic, okay? This is called the serial interval. Now, the generation time, the average generation time, uh, which, is, which under some uh, independence hypothesis is equal to the serial interval is about six, seven days. So it means that, that the, the scale, the time scale for the infection is the order of one week. That is important. So from one infecting and one infected, okay, in the average, there's a week into one week interval, six days, six, seven days. Uh, as probably all of you know, the asymptomatic fraction is quite high, larger than 50%. It may uh, vary uh, between countries. You probably uh, know that it is, um, more likely that old people uh, show symptoms than, uh, um, than uh, uh, young people. So the asymptomatic fraction might be higher in countries where there are a lot of young people and uh, let's say it's smaller in uh, countries like Italy uh, uh, with a lot of old people. Now, one important message is that the maximum infectiousness occurs during the pre-symptom transmission. So that little time when you end to be latent and you are already infectious, but you've not developed symptoms. Okay, and that's clear for many, for many studies. So it is about five days after being infected. Then what happens that uh, a pre-symptomatic, uh, actually it should be sh sh that we should call uh, this period post-latent because uh, a pre-symptomatic, some of them will never develop symptoms. So will remain asymptomatics. 
while some of them will become symptomatic. That's important for what I'm going to say later. Now, another thing is the mortality. Uh, mortality is about one, two percent. Of course, it, it depends uh, upon uh, condition, upon the uh, sanitary system, upon the fact that uh, there are many old people and of course the old people have a higher mortality and so on and so on. But we know now that more or less it's about one, uh, two um, percent. And um, that might, might be compared, for instance, to uh, mortality from influenza. Uh, it is something like 10 times larger. So there are two combinations that make uh, COVID-19 in a way the perfect epidemic, the epidemic that unfortunately all the epidemiologists and the disease ecologists were waiting for a large fraction of symptomatic people and a mortality, which is not so low as to make ourselves uh, not very worried, let's say, but on the other hand, is not as high, like for instance, Ebola, uh, to deplete the infected reservoir, the infected and infectious uh, reservoir. Because you may remember that when I introduced uh, even the simple SI model, I was stressing that the fraction of, uh, that the prevalence of um, infected uh, uh, people and also uh, the um, uh, are not were in a way decreasing with the uh, mortality, the mortality rate of the disease. So, uh, and, and sort of an intermediate mortality, let's say, and a large fraction of asymptomatic make um, this pandemic um, so aggressive. And then again, there is a special signature uh, in this disease at the global level. So I'm going to show you uh, this map and this video that shows how it, start, it all started, let's say, in China and then it reached France and uh, in Germany and then Italy and then the whole Europe. And then, of course, it started spreading to the, the Philippines and Korea and then it reached the United States and then it reached Canada, South America, Africa, Australia and so on and so on. So again, the, it is clear that there is a very large, important uh, part played by space, by how the uh, disease develops in time and space. And therefore it is very important to take into account space. And in fact that, was which uh, in a way hit our interest, okay? Um, because we, we have been studying um, many diseases uh, um, in space and time. And when the disease uh, reached Italy, and that was at the beginning of January, it is now clear that it was January, maybe even December, but uh, that was not clear until the end of February. Um, and if you look at, again, at the development, the spatial temporal development of the Italian epidemic, th this is March, March 15, March 16, March 17, and so on and so on. So there is a clear spatial signature of this epidemic. And that's why we decided to uh, work as soon as we can very rapidly on building a model for the uh, spatial temporal spread of COVID-19 in Italy. And um, uh, that actually uh, was um, then uh, uh, materialized in, in, in this paper, which appeared um, the end of 
the end of April, maybe on the Presidio National Academy of Sciences. And uh, that I'm going to, to illustrate to you. Now, first of all, the epidemiological compartments. Now, the subscript I indicates the nodes, the nodes of the network that we're going to, uh, to consider. Uh, and then we have the compartments of susceptible, the compartment of exposed, but then we had to introduce uh, with respect to the usual single compartment of uh, in, uh, infectious, three compartments, because we have the pre-symptomatic infectious, the symptomatic infectious and the asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic infectious in each location, I. And then of course, if you are infectious and symptomatic, you might be hospitalized. Or if you're not too symptomatic, let's say you might be quarantined or maybe you might die without even being hospitalized or you are hospitalized and you might die or you might recover. And if you're asymptomatic, usually you recover. Okay, so that's the basic, let's say, engine of our model will all these compartments. And uh, here are the equations uh, and basically, the, again, the core of this local model in each node is actually the force of infection. Now, first of all, we can assume frequency dependent contact rates. Now, it should be clear that in an unpopulated area, uh, then you should assume density dependent contact rate, but that's not the case of Italy. Wherever you are in Italy, basically, um, you are in a in populated area, and, and therefore it is reasonable to think that every day you cannot have more than a certain number of contacts. So usually people have about say 10, 12 close contacts um, um, every day. So you can assume frequency dependent contact rates. Now, uh, so at the denominator, you have the sum of susceptibles, exposed, et cetera, et cetera, so the total number of individual. And then at the numerator, you have uh, who? The, the people who can infect. So the pre-symptomatic, the uh, uh, symptomatic infection and the asymptomatic infections, and they have, might have a different transmission rate, different transmission rate, because for instance, we, um, we're expecting uh, from uh, other studies that uh, the transmission rate of pre-symptomatic might be higher than those of asymptomatic and uh, or symptomatic in, in infections. So that's really the core. Now, if you go to the spatially explicit model now, uh, you have the local model at each node, uh, say the province of Milan, where I live, or uh, the province of Padua, where Professor Rinaldo uh, lives. But then these nodes are connected, of course, they are connected by mobility. There is mobility within each node, and there is mobility connecting the different nodes. So now the force of the infection, when you go to the spatially explicit model, is much more complicated in a way you have to now introduce uh, those mobility matrices I was talking about uh, when I showed to you uh, the model of schistosomiasis in uh, Senegal. Um, and uh, so the probability that individuals who are uh, 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 susceptibles, pre-symptomatic, et cetera, et cetera, uh, move from side I to site J and contact individual uh, people from, uh, from side I who usually live in side I will contact individual in side J and so on and so on. We 
even consider the probability that one individual living inside I and one individual living inside J will actually meet inside K and one is infected, the other one is not infected. And so you have a close contact and uh, uh, the one who is not infected becomes infected. Okay. And then uh, of course we have the, uh, again, this transmission rate, which depends on the stage, pre-symptomatic uh, uh, or uh, uh, asymptomatic infectious uh, or symptomatic infectious. And in principle might also depend on the site because you might think that there are different behaviors in different sites uh, and so on and so on. So this is the general structure of the, the uh, spatially explicit model. Now, for this spatially explicit model, you can calculate that basic index, which is very much utilized and that I have introduced to you uh, for very simple model, which is the generalized repro uh, the reproduction number, which is however called now generalized because it, it is uh, generalized to a, a model with a network. So again, let's consider the initial phase with no containment in force. So we can calculate the basic reproduction number. And to do that, uh, we can, as usual, start from the disease-free equilibrium in the spatial model, the uh, no infection, infection anywhere in um, all over Italy. And then we introduce a little bit of, of infection. Uh, Initially, the susceptible prevalence is one. And then again, at R not equal to one, we have a transcritical bifurcation. So you can run a uh, bifurcation analysis uh, on the model. And uh, uh, so you, you can find uh, a transcritical bifurcation which occurs at R not equal to one. Another equivalent way is to use the next generation matrix, which was introduced by Dickman, Esterbeck, and Matt. And one can show that R0 is the spectral radius of the next generation matrix. And in practice, this gener next generation matrix is actually built from uh, the connection of the matrix CS yes, uh, representing the uh, contact probabilities. Um, and then uh, uh, you, you can recognize uh, some uh, specific times, one divided uh, delta P is the residence time in the uh, pre-symptomatic compartment, uh, one divided by eta plus gamma A plus alpha is the residence in the uh, symptom, uh, symptomatic infectious, and one divided by gamma A is the residence time in the asymptomatic um, infectious. So in this case, uh, um, uh, because you can get infected from pre-symptomatic, uh, um, uh, from symptomatic or from asymptomatic, actually you have to sum these matrices, find the spectral radius of the sum of those matrices, and that will provide the uh, uh, generalized reproduction number. Actually, uh, when you calculate, um, when you do the, the, the uh, do the stability condition of the disease-free equilibrium and you go through the bifurcation analysis, you are considering the Jacobian of that complicated um, uh, system at the disease-free equilibrium. And the dominant eigenvalue of this Jacobian is the initial exponential increase rate. On the other hand, elements of the next generation matrix describe the main roots of infection and the dominant eigenvector of the Jacobian, which is the unstable manifold of the disease-free equilibrium, provides the geographic distribution, the initial uh, geographic distribution of infections. <clears throat> and in fact, this is the way that we got this be beautiful picture and uh, you know, uh, which is uh, courtesy by one of uh, uh, by two of our co-authors, Enrico Bertuccio and Stefano Micoli, which represent uh, the uh, main pathways, the main routes of infection in Italy at the beginning of the infection. And you can see Milano, Turin, Rome here. Okay. 
Now, of course, we had to calibrate the model. And uh, here you see a logarithmic scale, semi-logarithmic scale days. And uh, uh, so, so first patient in Codonia in, in February 19, and then the development of the disease up to the end of March. And these are the, the data that we've been using to calibrate the model. Uh, now, the parameter estimation procedure, I want to uh, devote, uh, say, one or two minutes to that. Uh, first of all, when you have to um, uh, calibrate a model, which is quite complicated, quite complex, uh, there is always a uh, trade-off between parsimony on the one hand and realism. So you cannot use too many parameters or too few parameters. So first of all, uh, we had mobility from uh, a national census at the municipal level, but we upscaled mobility to the second administrative level, 107 provinces and metropolitan areas. The epidemiological parameters are not space dependent in this first, uh, in this first um, paper that we, um, that we wrote. The transmission parameters uh, beta pre-symptomatic, beta um, infectious uh, symptomatic, and beta asymptomatic so are not space dependent. And then, of course, we had to take into account uh, that um, there were containment measures. So we should expect that uh, these uh, transmission rates um, uh, would decrease. So we consider a sharp decrease within two days after the measurements announcement announced on February 24 and March 8. And so we consider also the step reduction. Um, then, okay, we had red areas, we're going to go into, into that. Uh, of course, there was a reduced fraction of traveling people. How could we account for that? Through uh, uh, mobile applications, uh, data that were collected, um, by some colleagues um, from uh, voluntary from voluntary um, mobile um, data collection, and then there's an important thing: true spread of the disease from some initial foci. But there was not only one initial focus, although it was clear that the main infection foci were located in northern, in the northern part of Italy. But however, uh, there were other foci. So we had to estimate also in a way the initial condition in the, in the different, um, in, each, uh, in each province. And also the starting time of the epidemic. Also, we made another decision. The number of cases is not reliable. What is more reliable in terms of statistics is the number of hospitalized people, unfortunately, the number of deaths and the number of patients discharged from the hospitals. So we used the Bayesian framework. We gave priors for the parameters. We sampled the posterior parameter distribution via uh, the Marco Chain Monte Carlo algorithm. And uh, okay, technically we use the likelihood according to negative binomial uh, distribution. And okay, sorry. And here are the, the results. The results that I show for the whole Italy, um, these are uh, the hospitalized people, these the number of deaths, but also for the hardest hit regions. Now, should be clear that uh, these, these results are shown with reference to regions for convenience only, not because regions are isolated from one another, because that's, you know, that's a common problem with many other problems, that they focus on the data of that region if, as if that region were disconnected from other uh, regions. And the same is true for countries. Uh, at the global level, but okay, that's another thing that we should discuss. Uh, 
and uh, uh, here you see a pictorial uh, representation of uh, the spread. These are the data. These are uh, the, 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 the calibrated model at the level of, of the uh, second administrative level. And here is a uh, fancy projection you know, made by a simulation at the municipal level. But of course, he, okay, it is uh, just uh, in a way a um, fancy simulation. Now, one important thing of having a model that it is possible to make retrospective scenario. Because the one question that uh, we asked, uh, were the containment measures effective? And the answer is yes. And you can estimate how effective they were by using the model. Because suppose, for instance, that no restriction had been taken. OK, without any restriction, so no change of the transmission rates, no change in the mobility, and of course, no change in the people's behavior, that would have been the number of, uh, no, sorry, sorry. Uh, let me first uh, describe hospitalized cases. That would have been the number of, of hospitalized cases. And then you can um, consider another scenario, February restriction, but no March restriction. And that is the second scenario. Now, this is the reality. So uh, we had about 40,000 hospitalized people, a huge number, sufficient enough uh, to um, send all our hospital into big problem. But, the number of averted hospitalized cases were about 180,000. So we would have had so much more without any containment measures. Another thing that you can estimate is the people who were infected because the people that you measure, the number of cases, the number of cases that you saw in the Johns Hopkins site, of course, these are the cases that are discovered. People taking a, a swab and uh, the swab being positive, or let's say, a, uh, mm, are they using this antigen, antigen test? Uh, okay. I'm sorry, this is happening again. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so uh, you can estimate how many people were infected and possibly infectious at the end of March. Well, there were, they were about 700,000, 10 times more than the official number of cases. But if the containment measures had not been taken, then the cumulated number of the infected cases would have probably run to 6 million cases. So you see now that uh, a model is really useful in this way because you can also estimate uh, variables that are not measured directly. So, main epidemiological result. Um, we calculate the basic reproduction number. It is about 3.60, well, very similar, three. Let's say three, 3.2, 2.8, something like that. That is a common uh, number all over the world. We uh, add a confirmation that the pre-symptomatic are extremely infectious because we estimated that the beta the transmission range of the presymptomatic, and in order to fit the Italian data, the, that beta had to be much larger than the transmission rate of the asymptomatic or the asymptomatic uh, infectious. 
However, there was a large negative correlation between the fraction of asymptomatic cases and their transmission rate. Okay, uh, so that's a problem. Containment measures had reduced the transmission rates by 45%, uh, not um, enough at that time to make the reproduction numbers more than one that will be achieved later. And uh, again, the model allowed the estimation of inapparent infections and the prevalence of uh, susceptible and prevalence of infected. Oh, I'm sorry. Then uh, after, uh, after that, we went on. Uh, uh, Italy uh, came out of the lockdown on May 3. So um, we started thinking, well, what is going to happen uh, after May 3. And of course, uh, uh, everywhere uh, in Italy too, there was a concern about the economic consequences of enforcing a lockdown. And of course the lockdown um, is a mess uh, in the social and the economic terms. So we wanted to understand what might happen after the end of, of lockdown. Now, of course, the, 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 the first thing we had to do we had to um, recalibrate the model um, between March 25 and May 3, the end of the lockdown, which we did. And so we updated uh, the model. And here again, you see uh, at the end of, uh, sorry, at the end of April, beginning of May, uh, the data, the cumulative hospitalization and the model. And then we also calculated the transmission reduction and transmission, uh, what down to say 0 0.3, 0 0.4, depending on the regions and, uh, and, uh, and provinces. Okay, and uh, in fact, you see, you can see here, how about this again? I think I to, you should stop annotate somewhere. Annotate, let me stop annotate, where is it? What do I do? I think if you have the annotation, you can do clear and it should clear. Because I don't see my mouse now. Oh. There's something wrong. The slide looks nice though. So there is no sign or. Okay. Now I felt that I can now move my mouse to oh. indicate. No. Well, well, anyway, let me go on anyway. So uh, here you see the, the calibration and then um, we uh, try to have uh, future scenarios. So <clears throat> first of all, um, we uh, showed that there was a further decrease of transmission uh, after March 25, transmission rate, fortunately. And then uh, we tried to estimate some scenarios. So the blue line is the baseline scenario. Suppose that the transmission rate after the end of lockdown stays the same as it was during the lockdown. Or green and purple represent scenarios with transmission rates that increased by 20% and 40%. Now, uh, why uh, should they increase? Well, uh, because um, uh, of course, mobility increases at uh, the end of the lockdown. On the other hand, um, you know, mobility increase might be effectively be mitigated by the personal protective equipment. Now, people are free to go around, but they wear masks and so on and so on. And so let, let me show how effective that might be. Uh, so, yeah, personal protective equipment. Oh, let me show you. Krieges verhindern. Sicher sehen wie geht, sagen die Forscher. Zweieinhalb Meter Abstand zum Nachbarn nach vorne und eineinhalb Meter zur Seite. Am besten mit Plexiglasscheibe dazwischen und ständig lüften. Masken sorgen zusätzlich für Sicherheit. In this case, the surgical mask and the barrier. 
Okay. Then, of course, you might um, uh, consider social and physical distancing. Then, again, you might Im implement again a lockdown at small and large spatial scale. And then one important containment measure, of course, testing, tracing, quarantine, hospitalization, isolation of people. And then, of course, you might have a combined implementation of all uh, these containment measures. So, uh, you know, we sent the paper, uh, we had reviews, and of course the reviewers, first of all, they say, well, uh, uh, well, you all know that review take time. And first of all, they say, oh, it might be nice if you could update the model. So to answer the reviewer, we updated the model up to uh, June 15. And from here, you can see that uh, Italy was actually uh, quite, let me say, virtuous that in a way Italy, uh, although the lockdown had been released, were following the blue line, so the baseline scenario, as if the transmission rate uh, uh, remained the same as they were during the lockdown. Well, with the exception maybe of Lombardy, the, the, the big, um, uh, the highest populated uh, region in Italy, where, by the way, I happen to live. We also uh, uh, ran a sensitivity analysis to uh, understand whether the fraction of asymptomatics, uh, which is very unclear in a way, uh, was say 10%, 25%, 50%, uh, sorry, the fraction of uh, symptomatic, in this case, 10%, uh, 25%, uh, and 50% 50, 50 um, uh, that a famous study in, in Royal Gallia do. And it turned out that 25% is the most likely scenario because that was confirmed by the estimated the zero prevalence of the infected uh, a statistic, which was available in, in Italy on July 15. And for instance, it came out that Lombardia 7.5% July 15 had been infected with more or less, uh, you know, support the, the green line, the 25% uh, um, that we were considering as a possible scenario. Of course, uh, another containment measure that you can do is uh, testing and uh, tracing um, on a large scale. And again, what we did, we estimated uh, the, uh, for instance, the daily uh, percentage of exposed and pre-symptomatic people that should be isolated. Now, it's very difficult to um, uh, isolate um, exposed, of course, uh, because in many cases, when you were exposed, uh, the swab test is not yet positive. So it's probably more realistic to consider the infection generated by symptomatic cases and and trying to trace, to uh, test the symptomatic case, then look at the contacts of the um, uh, symptomatic cases, positive symptomatic cases, um, and then look at the contact, the contacts, and so on. Okay, just to finish, uh, one of the reviewer asked, are there possible scenarios after June 15? And okay, so, and uh, what about the problem? Uh, suppose that there is immunity loss. So we ran uh, scenarios when in at September 1st, the transmission rate were back to uh, the initial transmission rate, uh, March, and with and without immunity loss. Uh, I would say that it is now clear that uh, immunity loss at least for a few months. Not clear yet that there's not enough evidence uh, and, and, and hopefully we can uh, hope that it is uh, uh, long. Um, so these were the scenarios that we ran, um, um, let's say without immunity loss, the one you, you see here for Italy, for Lombardy, and this is what is going on. Um, we were assuming that were, uh, there would have been a new lockdown of, on October 1st 
instead the lockdown has been implemented one month later and that is what is going on now and in Italy. To conclude, so a spatial model, at least according to our opinion, including mobility, is fundamental if we want to project in real time the epidemic trajectories, at least at the very beginning, uh, when it might be useful to implement con immediately containment measures in order to stop the spread of the disease. In these ways, it is possible to estimate the demand for critical care, the, the, the hospitalization you should expect in order to avoid the, the, the big problem for hospital, uh, to, to estimate how much testing and tracing we should do. On the other hand, integrated model is also necessary. It, 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 age structure should be included, social contact structure should be included. Many other models that have been developed around the world and even in Italy also consider age structure and social uh, contact structure. But I, unfortunately, I must say that do not, they do not include space. Unfortunately, lack of available data is a problem. Uh, they are not made public. So in some cases, and in our case too, there was insufficient spatial granularity for some compartments. And if we look at the problem really at the global scale, then it is clear that there should be nested models from global, I mean, all the world, like for the problem of climate change, for instance, where you have global modeling and then nested, you have country models and then nested regional model so that you can uh, fine grain the strategies because the, the strategies might differ from um, location to location. And one thing that is unfortunately common to many countries around the world that although the data were made available in a relatively short time and you have seen the Johns Hopkins University site and so on and so on. However, in Italy and in, in other countries, most of the data were not made available to the scientific community. The scientific community was uh, requesting a wide availability of these data, but in many cases, this data only part, and I would say, a small part of these data, uh, of course, anonymized data, uh, were made available and that is unfortunate. Well, I'm sorry it takes such a long time. Um, I'm sorry, and I stop here. No, I mean, uh, it was uh, very interesting. There is no way to, no reason to be sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Marina, for uh, the, the very nice uh, lecture. So we have time uh, for uh, questions. So there are a few uh in the in the chat uh so in uh, one from miguel rodriguez uh, in the local model is uh, the parameter h which uh, i think represent the hospitalized individuals capped by the maximum hospital capacity in each reason region or is it assumed to be unlimited uh now i don't remember h no h uh... Now, I don't remember what I indicated with age. So. <laughs> In the local model, let me see. Um, oh, the hospitalized, okay. The hospitalized people. No, 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 no. Uh, okay, the uh, hospitalized people or the very number, it is, uh, number of people who are in the hospital at a given time. Yes. So yes, of yes. course it was capped by the hospital capacity by definition in a way. Although, you know, uh, the people were hospitalized and, and, and put everywhere, everywhere. So it was uh, really a mess. And, uh, and it is now clear that, that at that time, many people were actually dying even if they were not uh, without even uh, being taken to uh, critical care units. Hmm? Yeah, I, I guess this question alludes to the to the fact that the admission, for instance, to ICUs depends on the occupancy of ICUs. So the criteria change with uh, um, with the capacity. 
Um, yes. Then there is a question by Silvia asking, uh, what is the interpretation of the large negative correlation between the fraction of asymptomatic cases and their transmission rate? Um, yes, okay. Uh, the interpretation is as follows, that um, if the number of symptomatic, um, if the uh, asymptomatic case that is large, very large, then the transmission rate can be in a way lower because it is the product, let's say, of uh, the, the beta A and the, 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 the transmission rate of A and the number of asymptomatic because that will be, let me say, the viral load that goes into infecting the susceptible people. Uh, now, I, you know, a good thing of, uh, of, Bayesian, of Bayesian modeling, of Bayesian, uh, sorry, uh, uh, statistical approach is that you cannot only estimate the, uh, uh, the confidence of each parameter, but you can also look at the correlation matrix. And in fact, then you should, if you inspect the correlation matrix, then you find out that uh, some uh, parameters are uh, not so much correlated with the other parameters, which is a good thing. It means that they are as estimated, uh, um, that they're well estimated. Uh, if you see negative or positive correlation, that means that the, the model is not so parsimonious in a way. And that's why we were concerned. And that, that's why we made a sensitivity analysis in the, in the, in the second paper with respect to the uh, fraction of symptomatic and the fraction of asymptomatic people. And then the, the serological tests confirm that the, the fraction 25% of uh, symptomatic and 75% of asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic so that they don't even care, they don't, don't go to the hospital, they don't take drop testing and so on. It's reasonable, at least for Italy. Great. So there is um, a question about uh, uh, vaccines. The new, good news. Country. Of course. Yes. So, so a problem for 2021. And we hope that we are doing that. And that Andrea Rinaldo, is, is, I think, is still joining. Maybe the the no, no longer. I am here. I'm here. I'm here, Marino. Oh, you're here. There. Oh, the, the, yeah. the question. Yeah. So the question is. Oh, I, I think uh, that yes, yes, yes. We are working on that. Yes. So can uh, this model be used to optimize the spatial distribution of vaccination campaign? Or do you think that it is of small importance relative to the, the demographic groups? Well, well, of course, there are some things that, that uh, pertain to the common sense. And uh, actually, these are the uh, rules that, uh, in a way, will be enforced by the European Union to uh, distribute the vaccine. That you first vaccinate. Uh, people in the hospitals, uh, medical doctors, nurses, and so on, so on. Uh, people uh, who are at risk, uh, people in, let's say, retirement houses, and, and, and so on, and so on. Um, but then, of course, you, you, you can anyway optimize uh, the uh, vaccination campaign um, given some constraints. <clears throat> So the constraints are, say, the rules of the European Union, at least for Europe. Now the or, or the number of a batch of vaccines. And of course, the number of vaccines. Well, of course, that's... Uh, yeah. that's uh, well, the idea, if I may, <laughs> may right, I be hackable? So, oh, well, let's say, say 200 <laughs> million for Europe, uh, something like that. Uh, no, but the, the question is whether even a batch of vaccines and a set of rules finding out the best distribution in space and time of that batch is still and I think which are precisely what we are working on now. Yeah. And it is not trivial. It's not trivial. It's not trivial. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so there is a question by Luca. 
uh, uh, that says that, uh, well, he really enjoyed your talk and he found very interesting the Bayesian approach. And uh, um, he's asking, according to your model, which parameters are the ones that change the model results the most? Ooh. <laughs> well, uh, certainly, uh, let's say the, the beta of the presymptomatic make a lot of difference. You know, I, I told you that there is evidence, that is experimental evidence, that the presymptomatic are uh, very much infectious. And that's why we decided to include a component of presymptomatic. But it's not our invention. Uh, there were other people who had done that. Uh, and, but we found that that was fundamental. But then we didn't fix the transmission rate of the uh, presymptomatic. And it naturally came out from calibration that the, the, the beta of the presymptomatic must be quite large compared to the beta of the asymptomatics and the, the uh, um, infected uh, symptomatics. And again, it came out of calibration that the other two betas, apart from that problem of the negative correlation of the beta of the asymptomatic, are similar in terms of the order of magnitude, which makes sense. Um, they even from studies on, on the viral shedding. So viral shedding is actually decreasing um, after you, you, you get the symptoms. Or if you are a symptom, uh, asymptomatic and you are uh, followed uh, during uh, uh, the asymptomatic development of your disease, viral shedding is similar, kind of similar to that of uh, symptomatic but it is the pre-symptomatic with the, the highest viral shedding, more or less. Of course, then there are a lot of individual variations. I don't know whether I answered, Luca, whether I answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if I answer in the chat. So is there any other uh, question? Yes, okay, the other question is answered. Uh, if not, uh, well, Next week, we are going to have uh, actually one of the roundtables. They should appear soon in the program if they are not yet appeared. One of the roundtables is going to be preci precisely about um, COVID and the pandemic. And Marino Gatto will be one of the panelists. So there will be more discussion about it and more uh, uh, possibility to interact about the, um, yes. the, the, sure. the most important topic of 2020. So. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marino, for the lectures. Thank you, thank you all. And um, okay, so I'll, I'll see you at the right. round table. Yes. So thanks also, Andrea, for the for staying with us. Oh, thank and, you. Uh, and uh, so now we are going to break in the breakout rooms. Um, oh, sorry, there is actually a question that I didn't see. I don't know if Andrea, my, my if Marino is still here. Yeah. Monday, please uh, ask the question if you. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, please, I, I am asking. Um, can the generation generalized reproductive number have influence on the generation train of the model function Q? Is it possible? Uh, sorry, because I'm. I'm you know, at my age, I cannot hear very well. Uh, you okay. understood that better than okay. me. I think it's better if you if you type it because the communication is a little bit disturbed. I think you have a spotty line, probably. Okay. Oh, okay. I can type it right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Marina, I think it. Uh... Monday was asking about the generalized reproduction number applied to the COVID model. Yes, but again, uh, you know, which kind of question? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you want to know more in mathematical terms? No, I think it was a very precise question. Uh, I think he's, uh, he's typing it, so. Um... Is he using chat? 
Yes, I think it's uh, because I don't see a, a spotty connection. I was possibly writing. Okay. Well, I, I can ask a question while, ah, no, it's here. Please can uh, the generalize, okay. So uh, if the generalized reproductive number have influence on the generational trend of the model function Q. The model function Q. Now, what is Q? Oh, wait a minute. Well, I'm sorry, but I, I, what is Q, the Q function? Because I don't see, maybe I, I thought I didn't remember, but I don't, I don't see any Q function in my in my presentation. What do you, what do you mean by Q? Oh, quarantine. Ah, on the generational trend of the model function Q, the quarantine. So it's not function, you mean a compartment. So this, yeah, the quarantine compartment. Uh, well, uh, no, no it, it is just the, it is, it is just the opposite that, uh, the rate at which you quarantine people influences the are not, of course, because if, if you quarantine people, so there was, now let me share again my, my screen, maybe. Share my screen, okay. Okay, so there's a, you see a rate at which you quarantine people that are symptomatic infected. Because I, at the beginning, uh, at least in the, the first the first, uh, the first paper, uh, you know, at that time, Italy was not able to discover any asymptomatic. So it was a miracle if they did swap testing uh, for the symptomatic. So you are uh, uh, symptomatic um, and then you can be quarantined because the, the medical doctors might decide that you do not have enough symptoms to be hospitalized. And so you introduce a rate and of course the larger the rate and uh, the better it is in terms of decreasing uh, the or not because these people are quarantined and they are no longer in, infectious at least they are not so infectious. They are still infectious in the household, of course, unless they can isolate, they have a very large apartment and um, uh, in, in the family, you can isolate from one another, okay? But anyway, in any case, uh, you are constrained to, to stay at home and so you cannot go around and, and infect people. So the larger, that and uh, the battery in terms of the um, are not. So, uh, the, the, so it, of course, if you quarantine a lot, a lot of people, that, uh, that is a, a containment measure that will have a positive effect uh, on the um, re reproductive number. I hope I, I, that was clear. Okay, I see that you're <laughs> doing. <laughs> So, so, okay, so let me stop. Yes. Sharing. Yeah. Okay. So thank, thank you. Yeah.
My yes. understanding is fine. Is, uh, is uh, satisfied. So thank you very much, uh, Marino, again for for uh, again. for uh, answering to all the questions. So we'll we'll take a five minute break before uh, Jonathan Levine uh, question. And uh, if you're following from YouTube. Uh, um, the, the, the next uh, lecture is not going to be uh, live stream, but we'll be back on YouTube for the lecture of uh, Daniel Segre at 5 p.m. Italian time. So uh, we're going to be splitted in breakout rooms. See you in uh, uh, five minutes.